Welcome to another episode of the Coco Podcast, a place where we amplify voices in the chocolate and cocoa industry in search for true sustainability. I am your host, Emma Rose, and today I am joined by an amazing woman who's done a lot to enlighten chocolate lovers to the not so lovely side of the chocolate industry. Anne Riggs founded Slave Free Chocolate after she heard in the UK that chocolate is tied to child slavery. Upon her return to the US, she thought she might donate to a group working on this, but to her dismay, she found absolutely nothing that focused on bringing attention to the plight of these farmers and children. Anne decided to take this up um, as she felt it was what she should do. She is not only she is not connected to the chocolate or food industry in any manner, and her independence from the industry allows her voice to be her own. She is no stranger to activism work in the social justice space, but makes her living as an architectural finisher. Her passion for her work in the chocolate industry is inspired by her two daughters. In her words, I'm a mom and moms don't like it when children suffer. Slavefreechocolate.org is truly one of the best resources I've stumbled upon while researching ethical chocolate. And I'm so glad to have you here with me today. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm personally very grateful for your work. So it's really an honor to have you join the conversation. Oh, on my wow. Podcast. Thank you for your kind words. Great. Right, thank you. <laughs> um, so tell us something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. Um, oh, gosh. Um, something that people don't know. Well, I, I don't have anything to do with the chocolate industry. And although I like chocolate, I didn't get into this because I was like a chocoholic or anything like that. I got into this because of only because of, you know, when I heard about what was happening with the children and I found that out in 2006, 2007, I was actually on a flight home from the UK to the United States. And I ran very randomly met a BBC um, world correspondent by the name of Humphrey Hoxley. And we were just having one of those like random airport, you know, conversations, you know, right? People were on layovers and all that. And he had told me that he had either just gotten back from Cote d'Ivoire or he was going to Cote d'Ivoire doing um, pieces on child slavery in the chocolate industry. And I had like no idea. I had never heard anything like that before. And when I got back kind of on jet lagged, you know, I did some, inter you know, internet querying and I found nothing. I found absolutely nothing. Right? There was nothing. There was one um, kind of chocolatier blog post that had one page about the Harkin Angle Protocol on his last page. And I thought, wow, this is crazy. This obviously seems to be true. Here's the Harkin Angle Protocol. Here's, you know, just a tiny bit of other information, but nobody knows anything about it. So I'm like, well, this is not going to work. So I wanted to maybe donate to an organization or help an organization, but there wasn't one. So I thought, well, all right, I just guess I will start this. And that's how it all happened, started and happened. Wow. That's crazy. So what was your main goal when you decided to create Slave Free Chocolate? Well, you know, in so many instances of like trafficking, right? Let's say sex trafficking, for example, we don't know who these culprits are, right? It takes Interpol and the FBI tons of work to come up with maybe a name or, you know, maybe an organization. But here we have all the people that signed the Harkin Engel, Engel Protocol. They all signed that they knew that there was child slavery in the industry. They knew that they were profiting off of the child slavery in the industry and they promised to remedy it. So when I first started this, I thought, wow, this might not take long this should be the low hanging fruit of abolition because we know who the perpetrators are. They've admitted that they're profiting off of this, you know, these traffic kids. They promised to change it, they're, but for some reason they're not. And at that time, I didn't know why, but I thought, well, you know, if, if we can say tackle this one, since this should be the easiest one, then maybe that will give our planet, you know, people who are concerned with humanitarian rights, like the power and inspiration to say hit other industries which aren't so transparent as to where the problem is and who's behind it. So that um, I guess is how I got started. And then that's, I thought it was gonna be honestly, I thought it was gonna be like, well, like a three year thing or something like that. And I've been doing it now for 16 years wow. and the journey just gets more complex and harder as 
me and you know all the other people you know whether they're chocolate makers chocolatiers citizens attorneys as we're trying to fight this this problem um it just seems to get harder and more complex wow that's crazy i personally have only been uh in the chocolate industry for two years for a solid two years now and okay, okay, yeah. definitely okay. sound new to this but it's just crazy to hear like how long this fight has been going on and you know how long ago the hark and angle protocol was signed and how many extensions these companies have given themselves oh yeah yeah it's, it's crazy and um there are many brands now who are infiltrating the ethical chocolate niche um yes and marketing their so-called ethical chocolate one of the most prominent ones I can think of is Tony's Chocolate Only. Uh -huh. um, however, their noble mission is tainted by the fact that they source from the world's largest chocolate producer, Barry Calibo, who profits quite directly from slavery. Yes, um, I took them. Yeah, I took them off the, the slavery chocolate ethical list. Right. After keeping them on for like 15 years, I took them off early this year. It caused a bunch of hubbub in the <laughs> industry. Right. Well, this is very con like confusing for a lot of for a lot of consumers, but more than that, it's also just very misleading for those of us who don't do any research beyond what's written on the label. Um, and yeah, yeah, I was wondering if you had any idea how we can make sure we're not misusing our purchasing power when all of that is going on. Well, well, it gets tough. We we now live in kind of an environment where you know you people will give give attention to something for like six minutes six seconds or something like that right mm -hmm. so you know if the label doesn't say it you know how are people stopping and like pulling pulling the thread here to see what's really happening i think that it gives an advantage to any kind of marketer you know to say like one of my you know in, in regards to cacao one of my most hated words is sustainable when i started slavery chocolate nobody was using the word sustainable for anything anything right maybe some farmers and some things but it only meant can we have another crop next year of a plant right are we going to get another crop next year and maybe in five years that was what sustainable was and so here's another word where like the big chocolate companies and other and other industries they put it under this big umbrella that they're throwing in labor, they're throwing in, you know, happy farmers or throwing in children under this umbrella of sustainable and sustainable doesn't even in my world doesn't even mean that. So, you know, we, we and I think that's, I think that as the explosion of the internet explosion of, you know, we're spending six seconds, you know, researching something, right? It, it, it all makes everything harder for the consumer to find out, you know, if they're really buying something that's you know aligned with ethics or they wouldn't be concerned in the first place if it didn't so what is your top strategy for fixing this broken system um i, I think my top strategy is really to um encourage people to actually really super act do action when i first started slave free chocolate it was before facebook it was before definitely TikTok. You know, all, it was even before Twitter, before all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we were doing is if somebody was concerned about something or somebody cared about something, then they would write an email, they'd write a letter, or we get an organization, maybe there'd be like a Sunday school class and all the Sunday school kids would write a little letter and they'd send it into their congressman or they'd send it to Hershey's or something like that. People would protest, people would, you know, you know, write articles i still write articles so people if they cared action actually meant action and now what we've seen with the explosion of social media it's a mixed bag on one hand it's a great way to educate people if they you know the give people that six seconds six seconds of something it's a great way to spread awareness it's a great way to spread education but what i've seen since i've been since i so i've, I've been there in the old days is that people are lulled into this idea that if they like a post or gives a give a thumbs up or give a frowny face that they've actually done something and it's 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 not that it's not important because you know it does spread like you know you know this person doesn't like you know slave tainted products oh maybe i don't either but it's not enough it's not enough to qualify as true action it's not a protest 
It's not a letter. It's not a boycott. It's not getting onto these big chocolate companies' radar. You know, even so, for example, like something like a a petition, right? You're, you know, I see those petitions all the time, signing a little petition. You know, petition is a great way to say, okay, to spread awareness on something. To say, oh wow, you know, you these turtles are dying over here. You know, to sign this petition, right? But do you really, but it's not going to change anything, you know, like, so, so Hershey's gets this petition that nobody likes slavery in their chocolate, how are they going to react to it? Well, what they've been doing, saying, but we don't have it, or, you know, we have these initiatives, or we're trying, or we, you know, there's all sorts of, like, smoke and mirrors marketing excuses, but on the other hand, I want to make sure that, and encourage people to actually act, to actually act, actually do something you know, other than thinking, oh, you know, I, I, I like to post about the turtles or I gave a frowny face about the turtles. I've saved turtles. It doesn't work that way. Right. So then beyond choosing uh, to purchase ethical chocolate, what is um, what are key actions we can take that will improve the system? I think mainly it's um, pressuring the complicit companies. They're the ones that you know, have been benefiting from this problem. Um, they're the ones that haven't cleaned up their act in this problem. They're, they are the only ones who can fix it. It's, you know, it's a great thing for, to give consumers a choice. It's great for them to have, you know, ethical chocolate that they can buy. And they should definitely be doing that. But if you add everything into the artisan, you know, ethical chocolate market, it's just a drop in the ocean of all the chocolate that gets sold. Halloween, right. Christmas you know, Valentine's Day, Easter, right? But that's when, that's when the masses amounts of, you know, cheap chocolate come, come into being. So if there was some sort of magic wand, something, and maybe somebody or something can happen, but what's going to have to happen or what needs to happen is the big complicit chocolate companies, they all need to come to the table at the same time. They're kind of like a cartel, right? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the problems we have is the beans that are coming from deep in the bushes of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, they all are getting mixed up. So, you know, saying if Hershey said, well, we're going to be, you know, we promise transparency. Well, that's almost kind of impossible, right? We're going to do this. We're going to do that. They need to come to the table. They need to say, okay, we A, have to start paying these farmers living wage for their beans, A, nothing, if they don't do that, nothing else is going to change. And then B, work together on some of the initiatives. Now, over the last 16 years, I have seen countless, countless initiatives. Some, some started by the complicit companies themselves. It's just their way of saying, see, we're working on it. We have this initiative over here. Mm -hmm. Some by, you know, activists, some by well-meaning NGOs. There's a lot of different initiatives. And I think those initiatives probably have a lot of value, but unless the farmers are making a living wage for their beans, not all these initiatives are for not. Nothing's, nothing's gonna happen. So nothing's gonna happen positively if those initiatives aren't backed by a living wage. Right, so paying more for the cocoa beans is really the key answer here to stopping has, a lot yes, of Yes, it has to be the key answer. The reason yeah. we have slaves in the chocolate industry is because the average farmer at Coke de Bar makes 75 cents a day. Like, how is he going to purchase paid adult labor when he could barely feed his family? That, that's yeah. what we're talking about. So, no, is just paying them more going to solve all these problems? No, but that's like the baseline thing that has to happen. And then People can come and look at these different initiatives, traceability programs, you know, educational programs, building schools, all that needs to come on top of the fact that these farmers are getting paid a decent wage for their beans. Right, right. If you personally had one million to invest in the chocolate industry in 2021, how would you choose to spend it? I would spend it and coming up with some way that would bring these cocoa these chocolate companies to the table you know some sort of public way like i've reached out for example i wouldn't give these people this money i don't think it'd work but i i reached out and i've been lobbying like the catholic church to say wow you guys have so much power you have this you have you have you know your 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 word your narrative stretches over our whole planet right you need some really good press for sure right why not say hey you know let's Let's bring, 
you know, let's bring these eight companies to the table publicly and say, let's hash this out, right? Let's hash this out. You know, the gig is up. We need to hash this out. Let's start here publicly. They're all sitting around the table. I would use that million dollars to sort of somehow get bribe somebody into say getting these people to the table is it the catholic church you know they've tur- they, they t- turned me down i'll like, keep poking at them <laughs> is there some sort of you know non-corrupt you know institution that could do that some sort of celebrity some sort of something to say hey we're going to take care of this once and for all here's a meeting place send in your coos or whomever you need to do and let's hash this out publicly so that they can't turn around and say they've already done something that they haven't done, which is usually the case. Right. That was how I would spend that money. I like that. I like that a lot. Awesome. Is there anything else you want to say to our listeners today? Um, I would want to say that just keep fighting the fight. It seems like the, the, the more you do, the more smoke and mirrors tactics come up, the more people have a different way of saying that there really isn't a problem here. And there's even some influential people that are gaslighting the industry that they're not finding, you know, slavery in the sector, but the facts, you know, tell a different story to just say, keep doing that, keep encouraging people to, to act, you know, buying, you know, buying ethical chocolate is one thing. That's a way to vote, vote with your dollar, but keep going, keep spreading the word, keep going. This is a, you know, we consumers really have all the power here. We really, really do. This is a consumer. This is a consumer product, right? Um, it, it it really can change. So just keep, just you know, don't shrug your shoulders when it looks like, you know, Hershey's just announced, or I'm picking on them for some reason today. Nestle <laughs> just announced, or Mars. Here's a good one. Mars just announced that, you know, they're sending in computers into the you know to the bush of Africa. Problem solved. Just, you know, don't don't buy into that or, you know, keep pulling the thread, keep pulling the thread. Why do you say that's going to work? You know, try to keep engaging with these companies. Eventually, eventually they hopefully will say, OK, gig is up. We need to come to the table all together, all together. There's not one company that's going to change a, another company's mind. They all have to come together. That's very, very clear. So just keep up the pressure is what I would say. And then keep up your good work, especially if you're in the chocolate industry. I know that if you're an ethical chocolate maker, you know, you should be triply furious because if everybody says that they're ethical and every company says they care more about children than anything else on this planet, then who is the culprit? Who then is responsible for the 1.5 million children who are either slaves or illegal child labor? So I know you guys have a big fight because you're competing with people saying the same thing. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. The chocolate industry is very lucky to have you. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so I invite everyone who is listening to go check out slavefreechocolate.org. Uh, take a moment to browse the site and look over the list of ethical chocolate companies so you can that you can support so that next time you buy chocolate, you're armed with that powerful knowledge. Um, and, and if someone is interested in getting in touch with you, what's the best way they can do that? I would say through my email, and I'll just get on this podcast, I don't mind, especially if you're a chocolate maker company. Um, Because also, just a final word, if you are a chocolate company, um, and I know you have a lot of industry people on your blog, the the ethical listeners, we don't have the bandwidth to say, try to chase down every small ethical artisan chocolate company. So you need to come to us. But when you do, it's also that you're joining a group of kind of pseudo activists. It's not just, oh, here's here's, you know, free marketing for you. I do want something in return. I don't ask for any money, but I do ask for you to say, push out things to your audience, you know, maybe, you know, do different things, maybe, you know, send a letter to Nestle, do some other things that that we can keep the pressure growing on these companies. And so we'd love to have you. It's kind of like we're, I consider all the companies on this list for us all to be in a team working towards the right to the right thing. So please, my email address is A as an apple, R as in robot, I as in igloo, G as in George, G as in George, S as in Sam, five, two, three at gmail.com. And tell me, I'll once you email me, I'll be able to, you know, reach out to you about, you know, what you need to do to get on the list. Or if you're just a consumer that has a great idea or something like that, I'd love to hear from anybody. Wonderful. 
Well, thank you all for listening. Please drop a review, share this podcast with your friends and spread the word. The chocolate industry is a powerful one. And the fact that we get to enjoy this food regularly should not be at the expense of African children's suffering. Uh, we live in the year 2021. It's high time we take this seriously and become part of the change. Catch me on the next wave of the Coco Podcast. Bye for now.